Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience, and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino. I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher, and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about executive functions. Executive functions are a set of cognitive abilities that are very important for a person to operate in everyday life. There are several definitions of executive functions, but first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. It's the seventh edition. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology, 2nd edition. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment, 5th edition, by Muriel Lezac. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology, by Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. So now let's take a brief overview on executive functions. So, executive functions may be described as a collection of processes that are responsible for guiding, directing, and managing cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functions, particularly during active novel problem solving. Barron says that executive functioning skills allow an individual to perceive stimuli from his or her environment, respond adaptively, flexibly change direction, anticipate future goals, consider consequences, and respond in an integrated or common sense way. Friedman and colleagues say that Executive functions may be described as a family of cognitive control processes that operate on a lower level process to regulate and shape behavior. Priban says, the frontal cortex is critically involved in implementing executive programs where these are necessary to maintain brain organization in the face of insufficient redundancy in input processing and in the outcomes of behavior. Susan Benson says that executive functions is a generic term that refers to a variety of different capacities that enable purposeful, goal-directed behavior, including behavior regulation, working memory, planning and organizational skills, and self-monitoring. Wezak says that executive functions refer to a collection of interrelated cognitive and behavioral skills responsible for purposeful, goal-directed activity and include the highest level of human functioning, such as intellect, thought, self-control and social interaction. So, executive functions may have different definitions because different authors tend to emphasize different aspects of this construct. So, the main definition of executive functions is an ongoing discussion in neuropsychology. But now, let's see how we can divide different executive functions based on different neuroanatomical structures. So, now let's take a look on how executive functions may be conceptualized within a neuroanatomical perspective. In the dorsal prefrontal cortex, we can see that this neuroatomic area tends to be associated with several executive functions, such as the generic term of executive functions, working memory, sequencing, cognitive flexibility and response monitoring. The orbital frontal cortex tends to be associated with emotional processing, social cognition and empathy, response inhibition and reward estimation. The ventromedial cortex tends to be associated with decision making, effective regulation, long term memory, and the self concept representation. And finally, the anterior cingulate cortex tends to be associated with response monitoring, error monitoring internal conflict resolution, and motivational and effective behavior. So, all these processes may be attributable to the concept of executive functions. However, there are several models that tend to emphasize different aspects and different sub-processes. But the major message here is that executive functions 
tend to be associated with different areas in the frontal lobe and these functions tend to regulate other cognitive operations. I know this is just an introductory video, but in the future I will make different videos focused on different executive functions. So now let's just see the summary and the key points for today. So, executive functions may be viewed as an extremely complex construct because several authors tend to emphasize different aspects. This is an ongoing debate in clinical research and in scientific research, so we don't have a consensual definition for this set of functions, ok? However, we can describe them as a set of low-level and higher-order cognitive functions responsible for goal-directed behavior. This is a very simplistic definition, but it may help us to understand what these processes are focused on. So, when we are talking about executive functions, typically we are talking about the cognitive flexibility, working memory, behavioral innovation, decision-making, problem-solving, planning, and so forth and executive functions may be differentiated based on different neuroanatomical structures. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description to see the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, like, share and subscribe this video. Also, you can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about complex intention. Typically, we don't think in attention as a differentiated process, but as we will see here, attention may be divided in several sub-processes or if you prefer, in several attentional processes. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So now let's take a look on complex attention. Attention is a complex mental or neurocognitive process that allows human beings to focus, select and maintain mental resources in internal and external stimuli. Complex attention may also be viewed as a complex neurocognitive ability needed to process relevant personal information to interpret environmental and internal cues. Also, complex attention is required in everyday life. There are some determinants of complex attention. Amplitude – the quantity of information that we can pay attention to. Intensity – typically is understood as the amount of attentional resources which are paying attention to a given stimulus. Shifting Alternating attention is the ability to be able to change the focus of attention from one event to another. And the focal point. Typically, it's distinguished by three major aspects. Direction, which may be external or internal. Amplitude, we can focus our attention to one or several stimuli and control, where our attention can be voluntary or involuntary. Also, here I will use the clinical model of Schaubeck and Mathieu, 
which is a model that helps us to understand several subattentional processes that are required to process information. Arousal, which typically is described as the automatic reaction towards the stimuli. Focus attention, the ability to be focused in one specific stimuli. Maintaining attention, the ability to maintain attentional resources and respond correctly for a long period of time. Selective attention, the ability to select and reject irrelevant stimuli. Alternate attention, ability to change the attentional focus between two or more stimuli. And divided attention, ability to focus attention on two or more tasks at the same time. Now you understand why I call this complex attention. Attention may be divided in these five sub-processes. Also, we can find several attentional difficulties or disorders. Here I will just describe a summary of all the attentional difficulties because I will produce different videos in the future specifically talking about these aspects, okay? Typically talking about attentional difficulties. So, one that may be described is a prosexemia, which is the total absence of attention, typically in coma. Hypoprosexemia, which is the decrease of attention. Pseudoprosexemia, decrease of attention in complex environments. Paraprosexemia, abnormal direction of attention, typically when individuals start to pay attention to irrelevant stimuli it seems that there are some impairments in the attentional process. And hyperprosexemia, which is an excessive increase of attention. Typically, this is observed in the bipolar disorder when individuals have a maniac crisis. So now, let's see the summary and key points. Complex attention may be viewed as a complex neurocognitive domain because it has several types of attentions which are differentiated in different attentional processes and there are several difficulties or several disorders that we can attribute to impairments in the attentional processes. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding to this theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, like, share and subscribe this video. It's very important to support the channel. Also, you can leave a comment in the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!